Well, hello, hello, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I'm Nurse Mo, and I am really happy that we are getting to hang out today and do some studying together. Before we dive into our topic, let's take a quick minute for a listener shout out because I do appreciate you so much when you write and share with me how the podcast or other things that I do have helped you. So this one goes out to Elizabeth, who says, I just got an A on my first exam, and I have to give you huge credit. I listen to every one of your podcast episodes on testing strategies, staying organized, minimizing test anxiety, etc. Establishing a morning routine did change my life and gave me so much more focused study time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. P.S. The episode on parenting in nursing school was a game changer. Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking time to submit that feedback. And I'm really glad that a morning routine did change your life. It absolutely did mine as well. So Elizabeth is talking about a podcast episode that I did about morning routines. She's talking about a bonus episode that I did where I talked with a student who went through school with young children, and it was just all about juggling parenting and being a nursing student. That's a bonus episode. And at the time, I wasn't numbering those. So I can't tell you the number, but I'll put a link in the episode notes so that you can click straight to that and listen. And I want to commend Elizabeth for finding the episodes that she needed. I know that when you're looking for a specific topic on a podcast, it's kind of hard because the way podcasts are published, it's by published date. They're not organized by any kind of subject or category. So I have made some playlists for you on my website. So I'm going to put a link in the episode notes to my new student playlist. You can go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash new dash student dash playlist. And that's going to bring up a lot of the episodes that Elizabeth was talking about that she utilized to get her prepped and ready for nursing school success. So, okay, today we are talking about disequilibrium syndrome, or to be more accurate, dialysis disequilibrium syndrome, or as it is more easily called, DDS. So DDS is a serious but thankfully rare complication of dialysis that involves a range of neurological symptoms that are primarily considered to be a consequence of cerebral edema and increased intracranial pressure. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought dialysis had to do with the kidneys, and now we're talking about the brain. What is going on? Don't worry. We're going to dive into it, and by the time you finish this episode, it's all going to make perfect sense to you. Now, DDS can occur with something called continuous renal replacement therapy, and I did see some indicators that it can occur with peritoneal dialysis, but it is more common with traditional straight-up hemodialysis. So let's first talk about who is at risk for DDS. So dialysis disequilibrium syndrome is most likely to affect someone brand new to dialysis, like their first dialysis appointment. It's also more likely to affect someone who has missed consecutive dialysis appointments. Other factors that do increase the risk for DDS are being uh, very young or very old. It does say that it is more common in children than in adults. Another one is a significantly elevated BUN, which is one of those key lab values that you'll be looking at when you're assessing patients with renal failure. It also will be more of a risk for someone who has increased permeability at that blood-brain barrier. So anyone with sepsis, meningitis, encephalitis, that person, if they go on dialysis, you're going to be watching like a hawk for signs of disequilibrium syndrome. Another risk is any pre-existing neurological disorder like a stroke or a seizure disorder. Also, any condition related to cerebral edema is going to increase the risk, right? That makes perfect sense. So that would be hyponatremia and hypertensive crisis. And then individuals who retain CO2 may be at higher risk. And what we're talking about there is generally individuals with COPD. 
So let's talk a bit about the pathophysiology. Though we know the symptoms of DDS are essentially due to cerebral edema, why the cerebral edema exists is not fully understood. So disequilibrium syndrome was first reported in 1962 when it was noticed that the mental status of many patients improved after the dialysis treatment was completed. But in some patients, it didn't. There was no improvement and they continued to have neurological symptoms, namely headaches, confusion, and muscle twitches. So key theory suggests that it is due to osmotic shifts of urea and pH changes in brain cells secondary to increases in CO2 retention. So let's first take a closer look at the theory that suggests it is due to a reverse osmotic shift. So as the patient undergoes hemodialysis, there is a rapid decrease in blood urea, especially in patients who had that markedly elevated BUN prior to the session. And this shift lowers the osmolality of the plasma, which creates an osmotic gradient between the cells in the plasma and the cells in the brain. So water loves to follow a gradient. So water is just going to flow along this gradient and move from the plasma into the brain cells, causing cerebral edema. Now that other theory is that CO2 theory. Dialysis may involve the creation of a CO2 gradient between the plasma and the CSF. This lowers the pH of the brain tissue. This, in turn, may cause the brain cells to increase in osmolality due to a higher concentration of hydrogen ions and acid radicals. So that higher osmolality is going to pull water into the cell, leading to cerebral edema. If not treated, if not prevented, DDS may produce significant increases in intracranial pressure that can lead to brain herniation and death. Thankfully, it's very rare, but let's talk about taking care of patients who have DDS or who are at risk for DDS, and we will go through that using the straight-A nursing latte method. So first is the letter L. How does the patient look? Basically, what are the signs and symptoms of dialysis disequilibrium syndrome? So the signs and symptoms of DDS tend to occur together. And some studies say it starts right after or soon after dialysis is initiated. And then some say it's right after it's completed. And then some say it can occur up to 24 hours later. I would say be on the lookout for it for the whole duration of the hemodialysis and up to 24 hours later. The key signs and symptoms are headaches, blurred vision, dizziness, nausea and vomiting, asterisks, which I can't say, and changes in LOC, levels of consciousness. The patient may be restless, confused, somnolent, or even manic. It really just depends. Severe cases of DDS result in seizure, coma, and death. And so that's all like cerebral edema, increased intracranial pressure type symptoms. Now, there is another symptom, though it's not neurological in nature. It is believed that it is related to DDS, and that is muscle cramping that can occur, and it typically occurs towards the end of the dialysis treatment. So now we look at the letter A. How do we assess a patient for DDS? So your key assessments are going to be monitoring your patient's neurological status. I want you to take any complaints of headache, blurred vision, nausea, and dizziness, whatever they are, any neurological complaints, very seriously. Notice if your patient is becoming more agitated, more somnolent, becoming confused, restless, all those things which indicate increased intracranial pressure. All of these are signs that DDS could be occurring. You'll also want to get a nice full set of vital signs prior to beginning dialysis, making note of the patient's blood pressure. A patient experiencing a hypertensive crisis is at higher risk for DDS. So the next letter in the latte method is T, and that's for tests. What tests are conducted for this condition? 
there isn't a specific diagnostic test for disequilibrium syndrome, but some lab tests may be done for your patient who is at risk for the condition. And so the main one is the BUN. This is that blood test that assesses the amount of the urea in the blood. Individuals with markedly high BUN levels, basically what I saw was greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter, are going to be at greater risk for experiencing disequilibrium syndrome. Also, a sodium level. Monitoring your sodium level prior to dialysis is important since patients with hyponatremia are at higher risk for DDS. Basically, with hyponatremia, they're already at risk for cerebral edema, so it's not going to take much to kick them over the edge. Additionally, one of the treatments for DDS that we'll talk about in a moment will put the patient at risk for hypernatremia, so you would be monitoring it in that case as well. You'll also monitor serum osmolality because of these treatments for DDS can cause serum osmolality to increase. Blood glucose, this is a simple test conducted to rule out hypoglycemia as the cause for the neurological signs and symptoms. An MRI may be utilized to evaluate the extent of cerebral edema and for the presence of herniation. A CT scan is conducted to rule out other possible causes of neurological changes. A lumbar puncture could be performed to rule out another cause for the change in neurological status, such as meningitis or meningoencephalitis. A pneumonia level may be drawn. This is a blood test that can be performed to rule out hepatic encephalopathy as the cause for neurological deterioration. Elevated ammonia levels cause hepatic encephalopathy, and an EEG is going to evaluate the brain for seizure activity. So those are some common tests that you may see utilized for somebody with disequilibrium syndrome or who may be at risk for it as well. Okay, now let's talk about how we treat DDS. So the most important component to treating it is actually not letting it happen in the first place. Can we just keep this from occurring because it is very serious if it does occur? The three key ways that we prevent DDS from occurring is by slowing the dialysate blood flow, which decreases how quickly that urea is removed from the bloodstream. So that's one. We can shorten the duration of the hemodialysis session. So that's two. And we can mitigate osmotic shifts through a process called sodium modeling. So when we use sodium modeling, the sodium content of that dialysis con- that dialysis solution changes throughout the duration of the dialysis treatment in an effort to slow the removal of sodium from the bloodstream. We, wanna, we don't want to create any of these osmotic shifts, right? And what we do with this is we can either use the machine, if there's a special setting on the machine that has this sodium modeling feature, we can do that. Or we can change the dialysis sodium solution as the patient goes through their dialysis. Another method utilized to prevent DDS is to use a dialysis solution that has a lower concentration of sodium bicarbonate. And that would be in patients who retain carbon dioxide, such as those with COPD. This is because CO2 is a potent cerebral vasodilator and can lead to increases in intracranial pressure. Now, what if we try to prevent it or for some reason we don't prevent it and DDS occurs? Well, treatment is going to be, first of all, we're going to instigate sodium modeling if we can. And if that hasn't worked, maybe we've already tried that, there are some other things that we can do. We really want to try to keep the patient on dialysis if we can. And that may involve slowing the flow rate of the dialysis or switching to more frequent dialysis sessions that are shorter in length and slower in duration. So say somebody comes in as their first treatment, they show signs of DDS, they may stop that treatment. They're not going to stop dialysis altogether and like say, no, you can never have dialysis. They want to keep the patient on dialysis as much as possible. So what they may do is say, okay, we're going to we're going to shorten this session, come back tomorrow and we'll do another session that's much slower and shorter. And then maybe they have to come back the next day. So we ease them into dialysis in that way with shorter sessions that are slower in flow rate. 
Now, if the DDS is severe and we're not seeing any improvements, the individual is going to need more aggressive treatment. So the mainstay treatment of that is administration of hypertonic saline or mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic. Both of these fluids will cause fluid to be pulled out of the brain cells and reduce cerebral edema. We also can switch the patient to a slow, gentle, continuous mode of renal replacement therapy called CRRT, Continuous Renal Replacement Therapy, that would only be done in the inpatient setting. You can also hyperventilate a patient to remove excess CO2 to reduce intracranial pressure. Note this is only an option in mechanically ventilated patients. It's not going to address like a lot of the shifts that are going on. It would probably be done in coordination with the hypertonic saline or the mannitol. And it was inconclusive when I was doing my research how helpful that was overall for patient survival. You also want to manage symptoms that your patient may be having, such as nausea, by giving something like maybe an antiemetic, maybe on Dancitron, and restlessness, because, you know, they're going to get restless. Their brain is irritated. Their brain is swelling. So restlessness is a thing, maybe something that could relax them like a benzodiazepine. Okay, so we've talked about how we treat DDS. Let's talk about educating. That's the last element in the latte method. E is for educate. So educating a patient about DDS, we want to teach them that advances in the way that we administer hemodialysis means that if the individual does have symptoms, they're most likely going to be very mild and they're going to be transient. They're not going to last. Serious DDS is pretty rare. You do want to teach the patient to attend all of their dialysis appointments as missing those treatments increases their risk of experiencing DDS. And you also want to teach the patient to report any neurological symptoms during or after dialysis, such as nausea, confusion, headache, and muscle twitching. So there you have it, your guide to disequilibrium syndrome. Now, when somebody talks about it, you'll understand why the patient's at risk for neurological symptoms when we're giving them a treatment for their renal system. It all makes perfect sense now, right? I hope it does. So I want to thank you for hanging out with me today and for continuing to hang out with me today and support the podcast and take part in other programs and resources that I provide. There's some exciting changes and new things happening at Straight A Nursing. One was the addition of the Power Guides, which is a new thing where there are study guides every week. I can provide a link in the episode notes so that you can check that out. Beyond Boot Camp, as it has been known, has gotten a ginormous facelift and a bunch of new lessons added. We'll be re-releasing that soon under the name Med Surge Solution, and I'm super excited about that. Keep an ear out for that exciting news. The app is super close to being done, so there's just a lot of really cool stuff to be excited about. I'm going to finish this these projects, getting the app out there, getting Beyond Boot Camp remastered, remastered, mixed and relaunched, and then I'm taking the rest of the year off. (laughs) So I'm excited about that as well. So thank you again so very much. I've got links for you in the episode notes, and I will see you back here next week. We'll be diving into pharmacology next week about a drug that is always on exams, maybe multiple times. It is lithium. So if you're interested in learning about lithium, I'll see you back here next week. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.